All right, so thank you for having me here. It's, uh, I've been here before and I love this, this event. Uh, my name is Agustin Nicoletacur. Uh, around these days, I'm turning 20 years into open source, 20 years since the day in which I distinctly remember that I took a conscious decision to dedicate my life to, to, to open source. I had a little company back then, and I decided to, to change it. So I used open source before, of course, like many of you at college. And so, I, you know, I've been reflecting these days, I'm turning 50 in a few days, so it seems to be the kind of, the kind of period in which you start looking back and try to face your next 50 years. And nothing better than celebrated having my first talk uh, about this project, which is one of the sexiest projects I've ever been involved with. It's called Software Heritage. You might have heard of it. I assume that most of you don't. Who have heard before about Software Heritage? All right, so about half of the room. Okay. Uh, I'm going to be looking back. Uh, sorry about that. Um, I was. I have planned this as an interactive uh, session, showing tons of stuff, but resolution came to, hello, all right, yes, here. Okay, so what do I do for a living? Uh, since a year ago I'm an independent consultant, um, I do basically two things. The first thing is I help organizations to improve how they produce software at scale, especially what nowadays is called software defined, which in my language is basically software that goes, uh, is uh, commercialized in a bundle with hardware. Uh, some people talk about it as embedded, you know, when you create 10 gigabytes or 20 or 50 gigabytes of software in a bundle with hardware, I cannot call that embedded anymore. Uh, um, but that's, and, and what we do is business intelligence, so we help them with that. Uh, and I partnered with a company called Viterja that you might know because they do a lot of <coughs> data analytics for open source development and open source projects. That's one of the two things I do. The other one is help com I help companies to do open source properly. In this case, nowadays I'm, he I'm helping scan and assess. There is a talk later on from the CEO of the company to um, strength their open source profile and their open data profile. That's, that's what I do. Um, I've been around, as I mentioned, 20 years uh, in open source, so I, mostly as a manager and, and as a consultant, I don't code, I, oh, yeah, I only code very, for a very few period of time, I don't consider myself a technical person anymore. Software Heritage, I'm, yeah, uh, it's a project that I've been following for some time, and uh, when I became an independent consultant, I decided to uh, join them as volunteer. I mean, I, I, I've been volunteering in open source for a long time. And some of you might remember me from KDE, my KDE days. I've been a KDE person for, yeah, in KDE is where I learned 95% of what I know about open source. So, uh, so I decided to join uh, Software Heritage because it's, a, it's such a cool project. I mean, it's such a cool project in capital letters. You know, we are all in love with the, with the code or the contributions we do, but when you find <coughs> something that is so sexy as this, it's hard to miss. Just, yeah, you have to get involved. All right, so what is all about? Well, software is knowledge. We know that. Do you remember those days in which somebody decided to, to somebody, a group of people decided to tell us that software is an invention, so it can be suitable for patents, right? We fought hard that idea, right? Software is knowledge, and, and it's not an invention, it's knowledge, and software has become essential, we all know this, so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna tell you what you know, I'm preaching with, to the choir here. What you might not be so conscious of is that, uh, yeah, software is, is essential for our, our work uh, in, in industry, uh, yeah, that's what we do for a living. But it's also essential for science. And open source is essential for open science. Right? We, we, have been, we have, our success has been so undisputable that we are spreading our, our, our wisdom to other areas. Open science is one of them. 
it's how, how it always should be, how it was meant to be. Um, open source is, is key for that. And then also, in, in terms of uh, when we think about uh, the, the industry, uh, <coughs> software is knowledge. Uh, preserving the knowledge is something that we should put effort on. Uh, it's important, not just for us. I mean, we are here because we learn from somebody else, and we learn from somebody else's code. And if you think about it in, in historical terms, things are going so fast that, you know, we don't look at code that was built 20 years ago. But, you know, now with AI, AI does, right? So we are learning from what was done 15, 20 years ago, if you are using one of those AI assistants, right? Uh, so what I'm trying to say is that we need to preserve the open source code, we need to preserve the code that is in public domain, and we also need to preserve code that is uh, end of life. That is not being supported commercially. Companies, organizations do go put it out there in products, and once they are not commercialized anymore, that code vanishes. That code is lost. So the interesting point here is that even the current code, or code that was created five, six years ago, that you guys use on daily basis, or you or you take a look at. You know, when you look at the internet and, and, you, and you think about what you did eight years ago, who, who has gone, who has had to go through this process of, hey, I'm going to look about what I did, you know, 15 years ago, and then you kind of find it. Or it's in your hard drive somewhere. And even if you find it, it's not usable anymore because it was not properly maintained. So if that happens with your code, it happens with everybody's code. So, you know, if, if uh, software is knowledge, losing knowledge is something that we shouldn't afford as a as, as society. Think about losing knowledge. How many things we don't know about the Romans or, you know, the medieval times? Or how many things we don't know about years, what happened a hundred years ago? Right? How much software is lost, has been lost the last 30, 40 years, how much knowledge? Do we have the code that brilliant minds, people that we admire, did when they were young? It would be extremely interesting, right? Interesting. Those, those programmers, coders that we admire so much, where is their code they started with so we can actually understand their learning process? What about those devices that we loved, you know, video games. Now, many of you who were playing video games at a very young age. Where is that code? Huh? So, it's software heritage is about preserving our knowledge in the form of source code. That's what the mission of the project is about. Isn't it beautiful? It is beautiful. Because it's, it's in our hands to do that. It's, it's not science fiction. It's not, you don't need something huge. You don't need, well, maybe you do because it's all. But it, it is a mission worth pursuing, all of us, right? It's knowledge. It's my knowledge. In the same way that some of you have gone through the process of putting your knowledge in an article, putting your knowledge in a book, you are putting your knowledge on software every day. And we don't think about preserving that. So, and those are, there are four, four key words highlighted there. We need an F word that is global, that is long term, that is resilient, and that is sustainable. Those four key words in order to preserve our knowledge, a cultural heritage we all have. We have a responsibility to do that with what our, uh, our, the previous generations did in order to pass it to future generations. And we don't think about that. As an industry, if you think about what we are trying to do all the time, is making everything disposable. I hate that word. Every time that some I, I have a cloud expert in front of me and talks about disposable stuff, I hate it, right? Because it, 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 it sounds dirty, and somehow it is. It doesn't matter. Your work, your knowledge, doesn't matter. No way. It does, right? Okay. So that's what we're trying to achieve here. 
And what is software heritage? First of all, it's an organization. It's an organization hosted by India, which is a, a very relevant French organization depending on the government for uh, research, and science, and R&D. Mm -hmm. So it's hosted there, but it has to stop the support of UNESCO, the United Union. So it's truly a global effort. And, well, I was going to click there on the annual report and show you what kind of things are the this organization about, the whole bunch of activities they do, and also I was going to show you the roadmap, and you will see a lot of the technical details there uh, related with archiving all and all the software, all the source code. Let's move on. Okay, this is what we what is called the Paris call the the, the the support that UNESCO provided to the project that started in 2016. And as an organization, it has a staff, full-time dedicated people to this mission, to archiving and making available all the source code to all of us. Something universal, something for everybody, an archive for everybody, that everybody can check and look, that everybody can inspect, that everybody, where everybody can save your code, their code. Not everybody's there, there are more people. That, that picture was taken in the annual conference that the uh, Software Heritage uh, celebrates and uh, organizes in, around Fossil in Paris at the UNESCO headquarters. Okay, so first organization, second archive, of course, that's a probably one. People are the most important thing, on, uh, but you know the archive is like the, the subject, and the archive is in fact three different content, uh, uh, concepts: the catalog, the reference catalog. So it's not just about storing the data; right? you have to reference the data, so you can consult the data, you can inspect the data, you can use that data, that source code. Right? I, you're gonna hear me talking about data, but please think about source code. In fact, it's not the same. This is about source code. Uh, and then is, in, in order to achieve this goal, uh, the kind of infrastructure that we are used to, no matter how big it is, is not suitable for the corporate. So a lot of what uh, software heritage is doing in terms of infrastructure and service is new. It needs to be developed new for this purpose. So there is a lot of there is a lot of research involved in the infrastructure itself, and also there is a lot of research, external research that uses uh, software heritage, uses the archive as source for a lot or as a target for a lot of different research. I'll talk. To, I'll put some examples. So three things. Let's. We're going to talk later about those three things. It's a community effort, and you know this is why it's relevant to me because it's not done in any way. It's not a digital institutional thing done by public workers in in a very administrative way. No, no, no. It's open source software. It's everything used there is open source software. So the, 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 the technology used to create infrastructure and the services to store, to preserve, to use, to provide a service is open source and is developed in the open. Which is a, it's something, it's, to me, is what makes a difference in this case. Right? So when you look at, especially in the contributors point, you know, there is a form. There is gitlab.softwareheritage.org. All the software is there. If you are into storage, I mean, you will find very cool things. If you are into data structures, you will find very good projects there. Why? Because the scale and the complexity of this mission requires new technology. If you are into infrastructure, if you are into DevOps, 
you will find a lot to, to inspect there and to talk about there. I was going to show the Matrix channel also, so, yeah, well, anyway. And then, uh, beside users, beside, uh, users, for example, there are many researchers and educational uh, institutes and organizations using software heritage on a regular basis. Also some companies, I'll talk about later. Then you have contributors, right, you can contribute. You know, your pull requests or your match requests, uh, if you see something that can be improved. Um, and, and you will be contributing not just to this uh, amazing mission, but also to an infrastructure that is in production that is actually very, very cool. Um, and then they have different programs for different kind of uh, participations, like uh, ambassadors, which is what, what, where I am. Ambassador's program, and if you are a student, you can also, or PhD, you can also uh, collaborate here. Uh, yeah, so this is a list of uh, ambassadors. There are ambassadors that are librarians, right? This is something very, very interesting for uh, that tribe. There are ambassadors who are researchers. There are ambassadors who are into, I don't know, what kind of science discipline. And then people like myself that are in the software industry. Right? Different profiles as ambassadors. Okay. And yeah, there is a community, of course, right? If, the, if this is done in the open, if the mission is for a common good, the software that powers the infrastructure and the service is done in the open, obviously you have a community. And, and that's what we have. It's not very big yet. Even the, the, in my opinion, I always, I always feel like this project is significantly underrated. And, you know, the, the first point is to increase the outreach, and that's what this is an example. But um, I think it will be significantly bigger in the coming years. Uh, and then there is also an ecosystem around it. And there are companies, there are companies that are financing, supporting this project because they use it, because it's relevant to them. There are plenty of ways in which a company can benefit from something like uh, software heritage. Uh, hopefully we can discuss a couple of examples later on. So you see big corps, you know, like Intel, Microsoft, or Huawei, and then some others that each one of them has a specific reason for being there because they use the archive in, in one way or the other. And then, let me go here. Uh, the, the testimonial part is very important here. Uh, yeah, there we go. Because there are plenty of organizations that are supporting the mission, that are supporting software heritage. You know, there is a web page with many different organizations. Many of those are open source, so you know them very well that are supporting our mission. So if you work for an organization that thinks that this mission is cool and that uses the, the archive, think about uh, telling whoever, the, whoever is in charge of these things that maybe uh, one way to support uh, the software heritage mission is, is joining us through a testimonial. Let's talk a little bit about the archive. The first thing is that uh, I was talking about source code versus data. I mean, it's a completely different volume when we're talking about storage. The software is alive, it evolves. The history is important. How it evolves is important. How it changes is important. You know, if it's broken, how it's fixed is important. So the structure, not, not the structure as is stored, but the, the structure that the, the developer gave is important. The dependencies are important, right? very important. So you need to take all that into consideration when you store it, because then it will be consulted, it will be used, right? It could be a lot of use, so it needs to be preserved in a way that is, uh, let's say, authentic, right? With, with how it was created that reflects and resembles how it was created. And 
Yes, and then we have the, the whole human side factor, right? Like tests. Call these tests, how is tested, right? Or, or well not so much about how, but the source code has tests uh, uh, involved. Or algorithms. I mean there are plenty of things you need to consider. So the first point of the three when I was talking about the, the archive was a reference catalog. And I'm not going to talk too much about it, but I, I'm going to talk about the most, probably the most relevant thing. So you, in order to, to, to catalog, you need to create an ID, a univocal ID, right? Something that univocally describes or tells you what are you talking about and where is it, right? Like the ISBN uh, for books, or you know, when you go to a library, you have, I don't know if you remember that, you, we, have, we used to have cards, right? And in those cards there were codes, and you know, it, it will tell you where the book was, or tell you or tell the library where the book was, right? You need that, that kind of thing. That's, that's an ID. And uh, at Software Heritage, uh, we, they created the software, ha what well, today is Software Hash ID, which is on the way to become a standard, an ISO standard, probably, hopefully this, this year. And uh, so it's in fact an intrinsic identifier. Maybe you, if you came yesterday to uh, Philippe's talk, he was talking about Pural, uh, uh, the, and, and which is an extrinsic identifier. And this is an intrinsic identifier. And the beauty of it is that uh, there are already people adopting it, projects out there adopting this. So it goes beyond software heritage. So when it becomes a, an ISO standard, hopefully a lot more organizations will adopt it. So every piece of code here, you can see that here. So you will be able to provide uh, a specific, a univocal ID to releases, to commits, to directories, to files, to pieces of code. Imagine how beneficial this will be, for example, for people that develop tools for, to detect plagiarism. Right? And you, you know, somebody is not, somebody is taking your code and copy pasting it because they are using some AI assistant without your consent and they are not respecting the license. And suddenly you use an open source tool or a commercial product, right? And you detect that your code is being is present in products because they are using GitHub Copilot and they are not respecting your license. <coughs> so that ID will allow the tools to make this work significantly easier, significantly easier than it is done today. Just an example. All right, the archive is huge. I mean, in, 20, in, in, nine, in six, 2016, there were 3,000 million source code files, and now there are what, five times more, six times, five times more, probably. So it's growing a lot. And the number of forks where, uh, that are being, where the code is being archived from is also growing. There are plenty of them. If you think about how many research institutions or universities, they use all kinds of uh, tools out there as forks, right? So we have to support all of them in order to bring their code into the archive. It's, it's, uh, it's a hell of a work. And the infrastructure is what we call built for the purpose. So this is, yeah, we use a lot of commodity software, of course, software that you use in your own infrastructure, but it has to be tailored for this particular uh, purpose. 
So there is a lot of engineering work. There is a lot of uh, you know thinking through and mistakes and corrections. The typical thing uh, in all big open source projects that you can find out there that represent a very uh, very interesting technical challenge. And it is very complex, but also it's very innovative. So I really, if those of you who are uh, who, who are passionate about new technical challenges, this is a place to look, and you will find a lot of good stuff. This is, for example, the, a graph of the deployment of the services. Um, so what we are really, really, really building here, and this is a, probably the sentence that I like the most, uh, is a full graph of the software development history. So it's not just archiving software, it's creating a graph that tells you a lot about the evolution of software. Mm -hmm. So if you think that that's completely different of a traditional library that we can think of, which basically stores books in a coherent way. This, is, this goes beyond, it's about source code, right? so it goes beyond that. One interesting point is that it's self-host. It's a central service, a centralized service. And then many of you will go like, oh, resilience. We talked about resilience before, yes. So I'll, I'll come to that. But it's a self-hosted. Uh, and those are actually actual pictures of the racks. OK. Now, in order for uh, archive and the code, there are different use cases. And each use case has a different procedure to do it. Now, I can show you the easy one, which is the one that you would use, which is basically you go to the web interface, you search for your repo, and you see if your repo is there or not. If it's not, you go like, oh, if it's not, uh, make sure that it is, because I want to make sure that it's archived. Right? And then there is an option that says save code, and then you put there your the link to your repo and then it goes to a waiting list and there are some automatic checks some people that inspect things and basically your your, your repo gets archived <coughs> that was a that was a traditional process there is something very cool that is they have created some uh, browser extensions so when you get you, it's it's a little icon. So when you get into your repo, it tells you through, it changes the color, uh, telling you if it is already archived or not, or if it's out of date. If it detects, if you see changes, and they are newer than those in the archive, they will tell you you have a yellow color, say, hey, yes, we have this archive, but it's not up to date. Mm -hmm. And then it will tell you also if it is already archived and pretty much up to date. So it's a very cool little feature to save your time. There is another process for uh, you know, entire forms. If, if you are a university and you want to, hey, I have this form and I want to archive it, that has a different, and a different procedure. And then there is another completely different procedure if we are talking about code that is not open source and is not public domain still you want to uh, archive. That needs to be curated and needs to be public domain or open source. So it has to go through a process. That is obviously very tedious and slow. So we only do that in very rare cases, like the Apollo 11 source code and things like that. Um, but we hopefully more and more companies will understand the value of that and they will, uh, they will do a lot of that curation themselves. So that's a different procedure. And then I, I put some links, uh, I will make these slides available in my blog and, and, and I, will, I will give them to the organizers. There are a couple of articles there that step by step tell you how to do it, but it's very, very simple. You go to archive.softwareheritage.org and there are two or three menus there and some instructions on how to do it. Basically, search, you just put the, the name of your repo or your file 
And then uh, that's basically it. And very, very simple. I, I mentioned that it's a research infrastructure. There are people using the archive to do research and then <coughs> There is a lot of research involved in the development of the infrastructure and the service itself. I put three examples there. First of all, and, and, and one directory. In, in the first uh, link, you see the publications. There is a list of publications that where uh, staff from Software Heritage participate, from the data structure to things related with storage, with things related with reproducibility. It's an essential concept, right? Uh, uh, provenance and reproducibility are essential concepts for this project. Uh, a, a lot of aspects: the, the software ID, the software hash ID itself, and other protocols to store uh, to archive uh, source code at scale. Uh, you will see a lot of publications there. So there, there are researchers as part of the staff in the topics that matters for software. Heritage. And then I put a couple of examples that uh, these, these two examples were presented in the, in the Software Heritage Symposium this February, and they are very cool. One of them, the first one, is uh, uh, WebGraph, that, that framework that, that provides uh, a graphical representation of, uh, of uh, data sets, in this case, the source code. So it was used a few years ago for Facebook. You know, it made a representation of all the software stored in Facebook. And it was back then it was kind of the, the biggest graph ever made. You know? So they came to software heritage and they did the same. Ours is bigger. And, um, and it was only Java, then they implemented in Rust and they were presenting the benefits of doing that in terms of time and storage and, and all that, right? Basically it was also a confirmation of, hey, you guys are doing something big, which is very good, especially when you're asking for money, right? Um, very good. And then the other one, I don't know if you, you the, the, topic, the topic for mine was about uh, AI, uh, uh, and um, one, of the key, one of the key elements of uh, having open AI is having open data sets. And how do you create open and maintain open data sets? And that's a lot of what the second, the second point is about. So these guys from Bico, they have created the stack. The stack is probably the most used uh, data sets in, in source code related data sets in, in research. And where did they take, where the, what, what is the source of that data set? They use software heritage to create a data set of source code of permissive licenses. That, by the way, you can go there and if you find your code in a data set, you can tell them, hey, I don't want my code there. And they will remove it. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a project that tries to do AI in a responsible way. Uh, so, yeah. And then the last one, that graph there, is yet another example of what researchers are doing. In this case, it's more an internal research, but there are also external people. This is about where the source code comes from, which continent, and how it has evolved over time. So. You have the, the QR code there, and you can see the graph in, in your computer. It's very interesting. Uh, the evolution of North America versus Europe, then very interesting. Okay. Oh, I can show you. Sorry about that. And then, ways in which you can collaborate. Of course, using it. That's to me the most important thing. Just use the archive, really use it. Instead of having to go to five different places to find the, the dependencies of your code, or I don't know, if something is, I mean, you, you get a fork, you get something forked and it has patches on it. And you want to know if those patches 
were made by your supply chain or were made by upstream. And if they were made by upstream, what upstream means in that case? Who, who brought those patches? So why there are some patches in these repos that are not officially upstream? And I want to know, I want to talk to the maintainer about that. Why didn't you accept those, these patches? Why we have to give them off tree for some time? You know, all these kind of things. It, it's so tedious to go one, two, three, four places searching. Right? Then, I mean, you go to the archive, and, and that's your starting point for a lot of these activities, for a lot of these inspections. Then, it's having a canonical place that has a unique identifier in activities related with auditing is going to be very relevant. It is so very relevant. Especially, and, and then lawyers take this very seriously, having canonical places where you can trust that what is there is exactly what uh, was intended by the, by the creator is very good. Because sometimes the code disappears, the record disappears, the project disappears. Mm -hmm. Or sometimes you change the code. All right. Then follow us in, in social media. Uh, that's good. Spread the word. Archive your software. That's a very important point. Make sure that whatever software you are working with, whatever software you're using, whatever software you create, your colleagues, it is archived. That's a very good way to contribute. It's good for you, it's good for everybody. You can become an ambassador like myself. If you are a researcher, then there are lots of possibilities that the archive can provide to you. So talk to us and let's see if we can help you how. And then, you know, most of you are developers. Cope with us. That's, that's a very interesting thing. A lot of what it's, it's like, uh, it's like the, the space program, right? There is a lot of innovation down there that a few years later comes to our lives, right? So in some way, we feel a little bit like that. A lot of the things we are doing now might be mainstream in the future. Then, uh, you know, if you use your, your, the, the archive, and if you, if you find uh, that it's useful for you in, in, your, in your professional activities, become a sponsor. It has some benefits, right? Uh, you, you need to think about this as a service. And you know, services are very expensive, especially at this scale. So it's a universal uh, infrastructure. So everybody can use it. But you need to maintain certain quality of service. So if you want to make an intensive use of the archive, we need to have dedicated uh, resources for you. So we do that mostly for unique projects or research projects or, or you know, uh, education institutions, of course, and that, or if it's for, for specific needs for specific organizations uh, to sponsors. We, we, we dedicate that, uh, those extra resources to sponsors. And then you can donate too. If you find that the, the cost is, is good, then you can also donate. And let me finish uh, with this resilience part. It's a centralized service. So the, the, you know, the subtitle of the talk was yes, the Alessandria uh, Library. It was burned. Uh, so, you know, things can happen. We are talking about preserving this for future generations, so we have to be receiving. So we are, we are also, we have a program for a network of mirrors, and we already have the first one. And hopefully we will have many more. Uh, in this case, in the is in Italy. So now we have one in France, one in Italy. Hopefully in the coming years we will have, ideally, one in every country. And that's basically it.
So that's one of the big questions. Who is actually the governance of the entire project? Who actually is taking control and organizing these things? In which hands are? So right now the, the, the project is hosted by India. So a lot of how it's shaped is influenced and determined on how India projects uh, work. The aim of the project is that when the resources are enough and when the support is enough, this is meant to be a global project. And, and the fact that the, the UNESCO is behind it is providing clearly the, the, the message. But some, somebody has to start it right? and provide. I mean, for something like this, you need a lot of support in terms of administration, financing. Uh, giving you space for for the data center. I mean, there is a lot of things that you need in order to start. And India is providing has been providing that for the project for the, since the very start. Any more questions? On over there. I would like to uh, to invite you to think about how what is this useful for. How is this useful to you? Especially, uh, I'm, I'm an ambassador for the industry, right? so I'm, I'm very interested in how can people uh, see themselves using this for in your professional life. Uh, what would be this good for? Uh, and especially, I, I have some ideas for, for the tooling, the people that develop tools, uh, SCA, service related, license compliance, risk management. I mean, there are plenty of of uh, uh, use cases, but I'm sure that you guys can think about many more. And you know, if you do, feel free to ping me. I'm very, very interested in, in hearing about those. Yes, um, thank you very much for your speech for this really important project. Uh, I did a quick search myself. And I was surprised but happy that you have a lot of my repositories uh, in your code. My question is. Two of those repositories are maybe the ones that I wish not would be there. One is about food recipes, <laughs> like hummus and this kind of stuff, and another one is a bash script repository for setting up the, um, like, you know, like the Ubuntu machine, which I created when I was a bit drunk. So <laughs> is, there, is there a way for me to, if I would remove those from the yeah. other cover, could I be forgotten in your Yes, yes, definitely. There is a there is a specific process for please no, don't, not this one, please, this shouldn't be preserved. I'm not proud of it, or this was a complete mistake. Uh, why is that there? Yes, uh, there, of course. For the rest of the audience, please don't use it to search drunk pending or overdone eatable. Laptops, remember archive.softwareheritage.org. Yes, uh, so my question is about uh, forks. So I also checked their page as well, and I noticed that uh, you know, there is a. My repository has plenty of forks with identical contents, like you know, the history is you know, repeated many, many times over. So I wonder if you, like, from a technical perspective, uh, do think of some optimization where you don't have to store the same shot. Okay, I'm, I'm not the right person to answer this, but um, in order to highlight what is upstream from what, it, what are forks is possible, definitely. What I do not know if, if in order to attack that issue that definitely it's, it's, it pops up over and over again, uh, we need we need from a technical perspective to do something first. It's so yeah. Sadly, I, I I cannot answer that question. I do not know the technical details enough to answer that question. But what I can do is uh, after the talk, if you give me your email, uh, well, 
I would have I would have just up the the poison in the in the matrix channel if I could. But I, I will try to do that, okay, for you and, and give you an answer. Because yeah, it's it I mean especially with the with the most popular projects, there are so many forks. It is true though that people do stuff on those forks. And sometimes uh, it's relevant to to for the subject. It's hard to know if it's relevant or not. Probably if it is a one-to-one -one fork, then why would you archive it? On the other side, maybe the original changes and you don't, yours don't. I don't know, it's a hard one. So, uh, one problem that we also have in academia is very related to what you are doing, involving the archiving of our search papers. Uh, is there any experience that you could set from, uh, from software editors that could benefit, for example, projects like Arcadio, that is used for the public storage of papers? Going through the roadmap 2024, uh, you will see a specific item about citation UI. Because this is a, this is a core topic for the, the academia part. And yes, there is a lot of thoughts about that, and there are technical actions to improve the current situation. Yes, yes. The citation is something uh, absolutely relevant. And so, yeah, yeah, click in the roadmap, and you will see there what is expected on that front this year. But there, there will be news in terms of uh, uh, citation linked to the software. What I cannot say if there is the other way around will also work. Software linked to citations. Yeah. Do we have more hands? Yeah. Uh, so do you also store documentation like books or training material or other software related? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this question comes a lot in, and also the, the Blobs, uh, binaries, okay, now the target is source code. That's the main target. But you will find lots of other stuff there because they are mixed. Because you know, we cannot put a, a, an eye on, on, on everything that we archive. So there is a lot of automatic checks. So it's not something that we actively perceive, but you will find the documentation. Especially now that a lot of technical documentation is on repos and it's very hard to differentiate when it's a config file from a document, a document file, then you will find a lot. And, but the, the, the number one priority, and if you think about it, a lot of how technical documentation is on today, is, it resembles a lot of how soft, soft code is managed right, and, and created. So um, there, is, there is a lot of documentation there. But our main target is source code. You, you will find also all the kind of things, like uh, binary sometimes, yes. But it's not the main target. The main target is knowledge, knowledge in the form of source code. So that's the main target. There is one here. There is one. Ah, oh, there we go. Sorry. So when you're looking for products to archive, how deep in the internet are you searching for uh, source code? How deep you can go? For how deep you can go? For what I was sort of you, both for the projects we found on site that we found on the but also if people submit it to the software as a project. So in the former case, how deep is it in the do you go to search for the software? You can go up to files. I, I, if you put the name of the file, you'll find it. No, I mean, like, um, to be more concrete, um, I've had a project where uh, we had our own uh, Bitcoin story on my brother on the internet, we own like, around 10 dollars, and then all of a sudden we got an email from the software editor about that the project is going to be archived and none of us knew why it was being archived. So either you need to go really, really deep into the internet and find source codes, uh, or someone inside the project submitted it to the software. So I just wanted to ask if your if your project goes that deep, if you have like a um, uh, we were more at four 
large level. So at fourth level, and then uh, I mean the the I think that nowadays that you know the bulk of the archive is is there. I think it's more sniper kind of thing. Uh, things that are not, and, and so there's a lot of submissions. And now, nowadays there are plenty of submissions. So, um, and then, for example, there are a lot of code that is experimental, and there is code that is stable, or the developers label as stable. So we go more for the stable code, right? The, the code that changes a lot. Is a it, 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 it's a burden in terms of resources for us. So we tend to go for more stable code, and the idea is to store everything that is open source or public domain. And if someone don't want their code to be stored, then because it's so simple through the either searching on the browser. Uh, extension to find out if you actually your code is stored or not. If you don't want to store it, then we, we flag it and, and it's not being stored anymore. But we, we go we go fairly I no I don't think we go we don't have resources to go too deep. It would take it would take a lot of time. So in if your case you can see it like hmm this this code is in this spreadboard it's not in you know, big forts and still they have it. I would say that probably is that somebody somehow submitted it or yeah, somebody had a dependency with their code and said, you know, I want my mine. I mean, there must be a, a good reason for that. 